Jeff uh, is, is a, a long time, a good personal friend and a friend of Reef Seekers. And he has been, uh, he's been an instructor since technically since 1978, but he was just telling me that he was under 21 when he originally became an instructor. So he had to wait a few months till he actually issued uh, his cards. And back then the Naui cards were issued in sequential order. So he got a higher number than, uh, than perhaps he wanted, but he certainly made up for lost, lost ground in those that in, in ensuing years. Um, he literally has written the book on uh, rebreathers. He volunteers out at the uh, Catalina Chamber as one of the uh, supervisors. And uh, hopefully uh, you, we would like to say you only meet him uh, socially out there, not professionally. Um, he is uh, a Dan Rolex Diver of the Year Award winner, which is a, a big deal in the diving industry. And uh, as importantly as all of those things, he's been to Antarctica once or twice or thrice or more than that. And that's what he'd like to tell you about tonight. So the one time I will ask you to please go ahead and unmute yourself. If you want to hit your unmute button, we can all give Jeff a nice little round of applause. And then you can mute yourselves again. And Jeff, yeah, take, Jeff. It, take it away. Yay. All right. <laughs> so let me start with the chamber actually plays a pretty significant part in this um, history because I was uh, on in my EDAM course, my emergency dive accident management course back in 1989, when one of the audience members stood up and said, hey, we've got a job for someone to run the dive locker down in Antarctica. Is there anybody here that's interested? And I thought to myself, that sounds like a lot of fun, but I really can't go because I've got a business. I had a consulting business at the time doing management consulting. And I really didn't think it was wise to leave my company. But I went and talked to them anyways, because it sounded like fun. And my good friend, John Rasek, years before, had told me about his diving in Antarctica back in 1957 and 1958 during the International Geophysical Year. And I thought to myself, someday, someday I'd like to go see that. Well, they uh, liked my background because I had a lot of overhead experience from cave diving. And they continued to hound me until I finally said, you know what, I'll take five months off and go. And so that was my first, my introduction to getting down there the first time was going down in 1989 to uh, essentially oversee the diving operations for the National Science Foundation at McMurdo Station in Antarctica. In Antarctica. And I did that off and on for the next four years. And at that point in time, um, I, I didn't go down for a while until some friends of mine said, Jeff, we'd really like to go see diving in Antarctica. Could you set something up for us? And so I put together my first ecotourism slash scuba diving trip to Antarctica. And since then I've been down back to Antarctica. Well, I'm headed back in December. I think this is gonna be my ninth trip down there. Although I can't, I've kind of lost count. Um, I've got 10 fingers. You think I'd at least be able to count to 10 but unfortunately I'm impaired and I can't do that. So at any rate, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with some slides. Let's see if this works. Well, it worked when we rehearsed it a little while ago, so we'll see if it works again. There we go. All right. So we're gonna talk about diving in Antarctica. And where we're going to head first, where we're going to head first, let me go back to, gotta find the right slide here apparently. You guys still have a screen, right? Yeah. There we go. There you Perfect. are. Okay. So where we're going to start first is here in Ushuaia, which is the southernmost city in South America. And from there, we are going to go across the Drake Passage to the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the northernmost part of Antarctica. And so the first part of this trip, we're going to concentrate on there. And then we're going to show you some other parts of the continent as well. And we'll be talking about a couple of other places over here are the South Georgia Islands. Here are the South Orkney Islands. So we're gonna be talking about some of those places as we go through. And Anvers Island is right about over here. So Ushuaia is where we started this, this jaunt. And this is where we actually go down. We fly from the United States to be able to start the first step of our Antarctic voyage. And if you ever go down that way, plan on spending some time in South America because there's a lot of really fun stuff to see. Not far from Ushuaia, about a 10-minute 
cab drive is Tierra del Fuego National Park, which is where Darwin wrote about seeing all the campfires from the native natives there lining the shoreline, which is where it got its name, Land of Fires. And there's all kinds of cool wildlife to see. This is a large silver fox. That's my son, Evan, on his second trip down to Antarctica, or second planned trip. Um, he's 11 years old in this picture, and he and the fox were getting acquainted. They've got a dive operation in Ushuaia run by Carlos um, in, uh, called Ushuaia Divers. And so it's an interesting place to dive as well. Um, tons and tons of big crabs. You know, most of us don't want to have crabs personally, but looking at them on the ocean bottom is okay. And the diving visibility there, at least when I was there, was not very good, but there was lots of really interesting macro stuff to be able to see there. So if you end up going down that way, try to spend a day or two spending some time diving. I plan my trips through a group called Oceanwide Expeditions. And Oceanwide runs a fleet of vessels that are engaged in ecotourism, both in the Antarctic as well as the Arctic. And so this is the Plancius, which is one of the vessels that I've used. And it holds about 100 passengers. And when we get there, we put all of our stuff in our cabins. This is what a typical cabin looks like. Um, we start off our day um, as we leave Ushuaia doing an abandoned ship drill. And so they have everybody put your life jackets on. They walk you down the lifeboat, which is this enclosed vessel here. They tell you how to get in. They tell you how to strap yourself in. And you can see there's not much of a keel on that vessel. And it apparently rolls like an e-ticket ride at Disneyland. Um, I've never had the misfortune of being able to get in one and actually test it out, but I've heard it's a very uncomfortable situation. What I really enjoyed is this is actually an international maritime process to be able to tell everyone how to do an abandoned ship drill. My first year in Antarctica, I was coming back in February of 1990. And you'll see pictures later on that we flew down there and flew back. But on this particular year, the weather got really bad early in the season and they couldn't get any more planes down there. And so they sent, a, they sent the icebreakers down and they evacuated about 105 people from the research station I was at via the vessel. And this is the first thing they did with us there too. They put us on our life jackets. They showed us to where we'd go up to the deck. They'd say, okay, now you cross your arms and legs and you jump from here and you're jumping into the Antarctic waters. And the last thing they tell you is whether or not the natives are friendly, which I always thought was pretty ironic because I was gonna be a living popsicle long before the natives ever got to me to be able to eat me. At any rate, also on our journey south, we take time and um, vacuum all of the gear, all of the jackets, the boots, the clothing that we're gonna be wearing, any day packs that we're gonna be carrying onto the island, any camera bags, to make sure that we don't have any spores or seeds that we might be carrying down the peninsula that could accidentally germinate and cause um, an invasive species, typically a plant species, to be able to propagate or establish itself on some of these Antarctic or sub-Antarctic islands. Um, and so we all have a day where we spend doing that. We spend a couple days crossing until we actually get a chance to be able to see the, um, the continent so for we don't actually see the continent first because we typically stop at several island groups on the way down. So this happens to be South Georgia Island, but on our cruise, we typically go through, we may go to South Georgia. More typically, we go to the South Orkney Islands, which are just north of, of the area. Now, I'm going down there primarily to go diving, although I do have a contingent of, of ecotourism non-diving folks with me as well. And for those of you that are divers, the the equipment we use is a little bit different than we typically use for open water diving. All of the tanks, whoops, let me back up here. All of the tanks have are use H valves, which are valves that have places for two first stages on the regulators. And so, and it, we have two first stages, each with a second stage attached to it. And this is the mechanism for those of you that are non-divers that break down the pressure in a scuba cylinder to a pressure at which we can breathe it. Because otherwise we wouldn't be able to breathe the air in the scuba tank. And we do this, we have two different first stages because it's not uncommon 
to have these freeze because the water temperature is so cold. Typically, the water temperature in these places may be, in the peninsula, um, 30 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And further south in Antarctica, the water temperature is 28.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the temperature at which salt water there freezes. And so because the gas is expanding, it's getting colder, it draws that heat in from the water around it. And you often come up with blocks of ice encasing your regulators. And occasionally they'll get some ice freezing inside. They'll freeze open. You have to turn off the valve and switch to your alternate regulator to be able to um, affect a safe ascent to the surface. We load everything into Zodiacs, um, rubber boats. So all the gear is loaded. We then um, lower the boat with the gear in it off the side of the Plancius or um, the um, Telius or whichever vessel we happen to be on for our primary vessel. We then load the divers at the side of the vessel and run off to wherever the dive site may be. And that may be five minutes away from where the vessel is, or it may be 35 minutes away. It's someplace close, but it may not be right where we're, where we're anchored. And then we all jump off the Zodiac to be able to begin our dives. And here's the picture of the Zodiac with one of the divers that's gotten back in after the dive. I'm standing, sitting next to one of the icebergs that we happen to be diving near on this particular day. Now, the diving itself is ranges significantly in what you see, not unlike the diving that we have here in California or other parts of the United States of the world. So we're down there, I'm down there either collecting scientific specimens or taking pictures. Many of the people are there taking photographs. We have big life, as you can see in the background here. Um, these are elephant seals and Galapagos fur seals that are behind, um, I think that's a picture actually of uh, um, Kevin Lee, who's a very well-known Southern California photographer. Back Ken, if you haven't gotten him to speak yet, get him to talk about nudibranchs to your club one day. He might know a thing or two about that. Yep, here's one of his pictures. Um, he spent all of his time taking macro and he took really amazingly good pictures down there. I mean, I was jealous that he could take pictures the way he did. Um, sea angels, another one of Kevin's pictures. There's large invertebrates. These are um, an Antarctic sea star. And what I find really interesting with these guys is that these guys have all these arms. They raise their arms up in the water column and they actually feed by collecting krill, which are little shrimp-like animals that are floating in the water and swimming there. Um, and I just thought that was something you don't commonly see are echinoderms feeding on free swimming animals. Of course, the biggest animal there that everybody always thinks of are the leopard seals. Within the US Antarctic program, we had a, a rule that if there was a leopard seal spotted in the area, that no diving was to commence within a one kilometer area of where the leopard seal was seen. So about a half a mile away. So obviously this picture was taken with a telephoto zoom lens underwater from half a mile away. Not so much. Um, sometimes leopard seals can be fairly hazardous um, there was an instance in 1992, I think it was, where one of the researchers in the U.S. Antarctic program was grabbed by a leopard seal, dragged down to 250 feet, which they only knew because when they recovered her body, she had her depth gauge on, which recorded her maximum depth. Um, Robert Falcon Scott talks about leopard seals stalking some of his men across the ice floes. But this one happened to be already well fed. He didn't uh, bother us at all. He looked more curious than anything else and spent about 30 minutes zooming around us looking to see what we were, which was a little uncomfortable, but also pretty exciting at the same time. The fur seals down there are very similar to the uh, California sea lions that we have here. Here's one swimming around Kevin. And one of the coolest things I got to do while I was down there didn't actually involve diving at all. We spent about two hours playing in the surf line in water that was three to five feet deep with the year old elephant seals in the water with us. They're called, um, um, boy, I'm drawing a blank now. Any rate, the, the year old pups spent the uh, wieners, they're called wieners, spent the entire time playing with us. So we'd be floating in our dry suits in the water and they'd be climbing on our legs. They'd be mouthing our arms to see what it was that we were. They were crawling onto our chests. 
And so it was just as much fun as I've had in a long time in diving, except it wasn't really diving. Like I said, it wasn't even really snorkeling. It was just bobbing in the surf line with them. So there's lots of really fun experiences, including getting to see icebergs and getting to swim and play on the icebergs. Um, this was a typical scene of some of the pack ice as we were working our, our way through the islands down there. This is diving underneath one of those icebergs. And you have to be a little cautious when you do that because the icebergs are bobbing up and down in the water column as you're swimming around them. And in fact, uh, near one of the icebergs that we were diving, it was grounding on the bottom and we could feel that reverberate every time it hit the bottom through our bodies. Just like having a really loud amplifier with a bass drum playing at a concert inches from your head. Your whole body just resonated every time it hit the bottom. And then chunks of ice would come floating up from underneath you as they worked their way to the surface floating up in the, in the water column. This is a shot of me underneath the iceberg, right between the iceberg and the rock bottom. That's a really, really not good place to be because if it were to go up and down in the swell, we would have nothing left but bosanic jelly left behind on the rock. You'd, not be, like Matt, you'd be like Matthew McConaughey in the Super Bowl commercial. Flat yes, jet. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Imagine uh, Star Wars if uh, um, R2-D2 wasn't able to stop the, the uh, compressor from compressing the trash. There you go. Uh, now, this is a really interesting site. This is off of the Antarctic Peninsula, just north of Anvers Island. And it may look like that we're standing on land, but we're actually not. We're standing on an Argentine naval vessel that sank in 1988, the Bahia Preso. And this is what it looks like inside the wreck. The captain was told by the scientists, don't take this channel between these two islands. It's not deep enough for you. The captain said, I know what I'm doing. I'm the captain of this vessel. He went anyways. And he might slightly have, might have miscalculated slightly. I'm not sure. But he did create a really interesting wreck dive for us. Um, that photograph on the left here, um, this is my dive partner. This is a tractor inside um, the uh, vessel. Um, when I was down there in 1992, um, we were doing sampling and I went inside and this is one of the pictures I took. This here is oil, fuel oil from the bunkers that had leaked into this cargo compartment. This is exactly the same tractor. Um, you can see the treads here and here. This is one of the wheels, one of the wheels here the wall on this side, taken in 17 years, no, 27 years later, when on my trip. 19, in, uh, 17. 20, 17 years later. So you can see how much growth took place in that 17 year interim period. And all of the oil in the upper part of the apartment was completely gone. We couldn't see any, find any traces of it. That meant that all that oil leaked out of this vessel into the native, the uh, environment around it. Um, this is inside the vessel again in 1992. Um, again, you can see some of the debris sitting up in the ceiling of one a different compartment, a different freight compartment. And what we were doing then is we were sampling both the sediments and the organisms. We would take organism samples from the bottom, we'd grind them up, and then we'd analyze both the organisms and the sediment to see what kind of hydrocarbon pollution had taken place from leakage from the vessel. And when I say we, I wasn't doing the science work. All I did was the collecting. Um, so I helped facilitate the science, but my job was to go down and collect the organisms. I didn't actually get to go run the, the specimens themselves. And we collected from different geographic distances away to be able to see what was going on and what the impact was of the shipwreck. Um, you can't go down there without looking at penguins. And there are many places where you get to see lots of penguins down there because of the penguin rookeries. And that was, when I worked down in McMurdo, we hardly ever saw penguins because we were so far away from the ice edge. They didn't get as far south as we were typically. But when on these trips, um, when I got to go down, I got to see lots more of that because we got to stop at the um, sub-Antarctic islands where most of these penguins breed. And there you can see a colony of just more than a couple of penguins. And Jeff, yeah. those are penguins going up the hill as well, right? Yeah, they actually, in this particular location, let me see if I've got a picture. Oh. Um, the previous, this, whoops, hold on. 
here we go. This picture starts at the shoreline and these penguins continue in this density all the way up the hill over a mile from shore. In this one rookery, they estimate they have 250,000 pairs of breeding penguins. Wow. And this is a king penguin rookery. The king penguins are the second tallest penguin available. Oh, that was a good move, Jeff. You guys get a quick commercial interruption as I uh, uh, plug my computer in. Um, the largest penguin species are the emperor penguins, and those live further south than the king penguins do. So it's uncommon for tourism vessels to get to see them, also, although it happens on occasion. But we got to see them in McMurdo because they typically, one of their rookeries was on Ross Island, the island that the station was located on. This is, um, you might think it's a different species of penguin, but this is actually the chicks of the king penguin. And in fact, when they were originally described, these were described as a separate species, which I always thought was interesting. Um, some of the other things that you see as you wander down there, lots of old abandoned whaling stations and research stations. So this is a whaling station on South Georgia Island. Um, and sometimes we get a chance to go visit the research stations as well, the current research stations. This is Palmer, where I went to as part of the science program in 1992. And when I went back in 2009, I got to take my son, Evan, with me and go back to visit the places where I got to work when I was working 17 years sooner. And so it's kind of fun to be able to see some of these stations. Um, Palmer Station holds a maximum of 43 people when it's staffed, fully staffed during the season. So it's a fairly small research base by the US program standards, but it's still a good size base by Antarctic um, research standards. Now, I keep mentioning McMurdo. That was where I started um, in the science program. And this is a shot when I flew down there the first time in 1989. And this is the continent of Antarctica. It's aptly called the White Continent. And you may know it as the coldest continent. Um, obviously it's covered. It's also the highest continent on the planet. Its average elevation is much higher than any other continent because it's covered in large part by up to three miles of ice. And what you may not know is that it also is the driest continent on the, on the planet Earth. And you look at it and you say, my God, look at all that ice and water there. How can it be the driest continent? But it gets very little precipitation in any given year. A lot of times it just picks up ice and snow and blows it from one place to another, but very little fresh um, water or snowfall down there. Now McMurdo Station is located in the Ross Sea about 2,500 miles south of New Zealand. And when we got there, we went down there um, landing um, on a C5 and it was a nice warm sunny day at a balmy 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And this is us walking off the runway and the runway is really fun because the runway is actually not on land. The runway is built on the ocean. Um, the ice there is about 10 feet thick. And in 1964, they actually lost one of the airplanes when it landed on the runway and the ice broke and the plane sank through the ice, through a crack in the ice. And aviation is actually one of the most hazardous parts of working in Antarctica as a scientist. They've had more accidents and fatalities that are aviation related than any other single um, accident. Um, we're located on Ross Island, which is where Mount Erebus is, one of two active volcanoes that pokes its head up through the surface. You can see a steam plume coming off the surface of the, the top of the volcano there. This is an Adeli penguin rookery at the base of the volcano. All of the work there at McMurdo is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. So the only way to go down there is if you're a scientist, if you are a contractor supporting science, or if you're part of the military team that's supporting the logistics to be able to get people there back and forth, um, or a couple of other specialty contractors that work out there as well. Now, how did people do observation work through the you know, underwater initially? Initially, the first work that was done was by my friend John Resick, and he actually was doing free diving below the ice. They would drill a hole in the ice, he would hold his breath, swim through a hole in the ice that was eight ice that was seven to eight feet thick, go underneath the ice, pick up whatever animals he could find, and then swim back up through the hole. 
And in fact, he got that job because he was the U.S. spearfishing champion in 1953 and 1955, which of course involves a fair amount of breath hold diving. Later, what they did in the 60s, they started scuba diving with, with, with scuba gear using double hose regulators, but that didn't give them enough time, nor did it give enough breadth of research because a lot of the people that wanted to work under the ice didn't know how to scuba dive. So they built this observation chamber with, that actually is a little room that is attached to a pipe and you climb down through rungs on the inside into that room and now you can spend time looking out through the windows at the light that goes around you. So here's a selfie of me on the outside and one of the researchers on the inside of this ob observation chamber. The How deep problem, is that window? Um, that window is about 10 feet deep, just below the ice surface. The problem with it, of course, is that you can't reach out and grab anything. And you can't follow it as it drifts by you and you don't get a chance to see it. And so it's pretty limited. And that's why people started scuba diving down there. Um, when I was there in 2016, I was there as part of a team that was testing rebreathers. And so this is the first institutional work in the US diving program where we dove with rebreathers down in Antarctica. And the whole idea is that we had no firsthand experience as to how well different machines would work. And so this whole, we spent uh, seven weeks down there testing different types of rebreathers and seeing how well they would function in these types of environments. Now a rebreather, for those of you who don't know, differs from, from normal scuba. When you take a breath with normal scuba, the bubbles leave your mouth and they disappear to the surface. And you see that on Jacques Cousteau specials or most of the TV shows that we have, most of the movies. Rebreathers are more like the same kind of equipment that they use, the astronauts use in space. Instead of um, exhausting the gas to the surface, it goes into a container where you scrub chemically remove the carbon dioxide. Then it goes into a storage bag where, you, where it's saved when it's not, you're not holding it in your lungs, and then you breathe it in again. And then it replaces the oxygen that you metabolize. And because these don't exhaust bubbles, there are some advantages for some of the environments that we're using in Antarctica to be able to do studies. They also have advantages for being able to get close to animals. So here's a picture of a shark at a shark cleaning station this is on uh, San Benedicto Island down near Socorro. This is about 120 feet deep. And this was the best picture that one of the open circuit, one of the regular scuba divers could get in a week's worth of shooting. And there were 24, 23 open circuit divers on this trip. They could only stay so long because you run out of gas with the open circuit scuba, plus you run out of decompression time. But it, with a rebreather on, I was able to stay longer. And so, Literally 10 minutes after they left the bottom, this is what the scene, same scene looked like at exactly the same place. And these sharks were actually coming up and brushing against my sides like I wasn't even there. Um, animals that are noise avoiders like whales will also come up to you. Here's a picture of a sperm whale um, with a friend of mine, Forrest Gutier, um, using a rebreather um, that we never would have seen if we'd been using open circuit scuba. And so the opportunity for rebreathers to be able to both do scientific work, observational work, and also photographic observation have huge advantages. And in the Antarctic, one of the places where this takes place, where this has an advantage, are the, is the work that's being done in the freshwater lakes. So this is a picture of Lake Frixel. In case you don't recognize it, this surface here is indeed a lake. This is the Commonwealth Glacier and for scale reference, if you see the shadowed cliff here, that shadowed cliff is 100 feet high. That's a 10-story building. So this is a pretty good-sized lake. The lake is covered with ice that is 23 to 25 feet thick. And then it's got water underneath it. And what they wanted to do was to study the water chemistry throughout the year but they can't stay there and dive throughout the year because the weather gets so bad that you can't have people there. So what they did is they would put in instruments like this and this lake is stratified like a layer cake with different water layers. And so they had an instrument array like this in each water layer. And once a week, these tubes would suck up a water sample and fix it so they could come back and study the water chemistries that changed throughout the year. Whoops. And so my job, the first two years I was there, was to go down and swap out these instruments, these, these collecting arrays, 
And the problem was is that they didn't want to disturb the layer cake water layers. And so all of my work was going down there and holding my breath, swimming out to the side once I was underwater, doing the work I needed to do, and then swimming back underneath the hole before I could exhale again to be able to breathe and go on to do the next work. So it was a kind of a cross between scuba diving and breath hold diving, just like my mentor, John Resicki, was doing back in 1957 and 58. A rebreather would, get, would eliminate all of that problematic not breathing because there's no bubbles that exhaust themselves to the surface anyways, and it would be a much better tool for being able to study this type of environment. And they're studying this because this is where they theorize we may be able to find life on Mars because indeed there's life in the bottom of these lakes in Antarctica and the environmental conditions are very similar to those on Mars's surface. And so this is an analog environment for looking for life on Mars. So in our testing and rebreathers, this was our team of five people that did it. Um, Christian McDonald, the scientific diving officer for Scripps. Um, John Heine, the uh, diving officer for the National Science Foundation. Rob Robbins, um, who is the on-site scientific diving coordinator, and Liz from who's on the diving control board at University of Alaska. All of our work would be done by going on these tracked vehicles, sometimes several hours to where we would go diving, where we would pull up to a hut, a wooden um, plywood hut that was dragged over a hole in the bottom that we would then go diving through. And this is a picture of me in one of those holes doing my 5,000th scuba dive, um, which I did back in, uh, 2016 when I was there. And then underwater, the visibility down on McMurdo's side is pretty amazing. Um, we measured visibility at over 800 feet at one point in time. And lots of animals, you can see some of the sea stars there, large jellyfish, um, different types of jellyfish that I'd never seen. I mean, some of these things look like alien critters to me. Um, large isopods, this isopod is as big as a hand. Um, for those of you who don't know what an isopod is, if you ever played with the roly-poly bugs when you were kids, this is a, an underwater version of a roly-poly bug, same family. Sea spiders or pycnogonids, um, we have them here in California. They're two or three millimeters across. This one is about nine or 10 inches across. I keep waiting to find one that's three or four or five feet across and that instead of me chasing him, I find it chasing me. So it's one of my common nightmares. Um, sponges, some of the sponges that we saw down there were as large as a Volkswagen bus. They just grow. Some of the animals um, get really, really large in Antarctica. And they do it because they don't have much metabolic, and they don't utilize much metabolic energy on a, on, at the same rate as they do in warmer waters. And because the waters are saturated with oxygen, a lot of them don't even have lungs. They're able to absorb the oxygen that they need right through their skin, essentially. Um, soft corals, if you guys like soft corals down here, um, just like diving in Fiji, not quite as warm as Fiji perhaps, but just like that. And this is one of the most interesting things I saw. You can see the ice on the surface here. This ice is actually forming on the bottom on the ground. It's called anchor ice. And what happens is, is the ground, the planet, can be minus 70, minus 80, minus 100 degrees on the surface. The ocean surface insulates the water from that, whoops. But you still get ground conduction through the, through the earth. And that cold, that loss of heat, transmits down through the island and causes the water to freeze from the bottom up. And a lot of times you'll find animals frozen in the ice that are still alive. And occasionally this ice will break free and float in the current and the, eventually melt. And those animals migrate using the anchor ice to be up for transport. Some of the fish down there, if we took a fish from here in California and dropped it in Antarctica, it would freeze. It would become a fish popsicle, a fishicle, I guess. Um, but the fish down there have evolved a protein that keeps their blood from freezing. And in fact, that protein is more than 200 times more effective than the antifreezes that we use in our vehicles. And so that's one another one of the reasons that we're studying, looking at biomimicry and ways that we can improve material science here. Now we dive through holes in the ice and all of us share this hole. 
So the entire dive team that's down there has to take turns because only one person can be in the hole at a time. The holes are 42 inches in diameter. And like I said, in this particular instance, this, the ice here was eight feet thick. You're not gonna chip through it with your knife. But we're not the only people that use those holes or the only organisms. And in fact, here's a picture of a Waddell seal. They're fairly common underneath the ice. They normally keep their holes open by chewing them with their teeth, but they like a free hole. It's like, oh my God, look at this. This is just like a, like a freebie. I'm gonna go take a couple of breaths. And while they're in the hole, you can't get out. And so you've got to wait your turn. And since they're a lot bigger than we are, we have to wait our turn. Now you may wonder how we keep warm down there when we're diving. Um, some of the divers will know this, some of you may not, but I started with a layer of expedition weight, polypropylene underwear. Then I put on essentially a form fitted sleeping bag. Um, it's a weasel undergarment. And underneath that, you can see me wearing a vest as well. So I had another layer in between those two. Then I put on a pair of heavy socks and then a pair of fur lined boots. These are fake fur for all of you animal lovers out there. I didn't actually use real fur. Um, and then we put a dry suit on, which for the non-divers is essentially a giant Ziploc bag that seals around your neck and your wrists. And you zip yourself into it. Um, same as, the, you know, same like spacesuit. So there's a waterproof zipper that keeps the water out, hopefully, theoretically. And then we put on gloves and I wore two pair of gloves. And then we have a mitt that goes over that seals to the suit. Also, hopefully in a waterproof manner to be able to keep the water from leaking into the suit at all. So we have dry hands. And then we put chemical heat packs in between the layers of the gloves that we wore, to be able to try to keep our hands warmer a little bit longer. And it's typically the temperature in our hands that limit the time of the dives. So an average dive down there is about 30 minutes. My longest dive down there was an hour and a quarter, and it was not uncommon for me to end my dives when I was crying so much that I could no longer see through my mask. That was when it was time to come up. Now I paint a really pleasant picture. You've got to remember that I'm staying down there as long as I can to get work done. Any sane individual would come up once they started feeling uncomfortable and could no longer work effectively. So that's what it looks like when we're suited up to dive. We're all standing on an iceberg here. This actually is just after a dive is finished. Um, all of us suited in, in dry suits. One of the more interesting things that I did in this 2016 trip is we shot a 360 degree video for the New York Times. And if you go to nyt.com, which is the New York Times website, and do a search on Antarctic videos. This is one of five 360 degree videos that they commissioned down there. Um, I helped do the filming on it. You can see me float by in several of the scenes, but you have to be looking all around because literally you can look at any point in the dive just like you were there in real life. And the advantage of that is, and let me say it's a really big advantage, is that you're not cold when you're doing it. Are those GoPros in the housing, Jeff? Yeah, that, those housings had six GoPros yeah. in each one. Um, this is another one of the really interesting things I saw. This is the surface of the ocean. The ice here is about 15 feet thick. This is the continent of Antarctica itself. This is the bottom of the ocean. This light here is a crack where this ocean surface goes up and down with the tides against the Antarctic continent. So where this light is, the ice is thinner. It's only about 13 feet thick instead of 15 feet thick. Here's that wall of ice. The bottom here was wall-to-wall -wall scallops. So if you've never been able to limit out on scallops in California, here's a place where you, I promise you'd be able to limit out on scallops. Not that you're allowed to take them. But the more interesting part of this is as you're swimming along this wall of ice, you would find the bodies of animals frozen into the solid ice. And here's a picture of a crinoid where the lower arms are frozen in the ice and the upper arms are still out waving around and feeding. You know, stuff like that I thought was really cool. Now you may ask, um, I've got some of my scouts that I invited to watch this. Um, so um, how did I get started in my adventuring, you may ask? 
This is a picture of, of me right here when I was about 13 years old. This is on one of our backpacking trips in the Sierras. And this is the kind of, of activity or the kind of experience that kind of pre-selected me or pre-adapted me for going down and working in Antarctica and many of the other places I've worked. We learned to walk in, in the snow. We learned to deal with weather. There's another picture of me over here. It's my brother, Scott, who's two years younger than me and my father. Um, and this prepared me for doing work in Antarctica. We we're working in glaciers and going through snow fields and doing the kind of work we were doing down there. Um, this is me camping in, in, in Boy Scouts. This is me camping on the ice. You know, it's really not a big leap to go from one to the next. Um, this is my son, Evan, playing snow fort and building snow shelters. And I, as a kid, built igloos and snow caves. And this is a snow trench. This is part of snow survival school that we went through as I was my first year doing scientific work in the Antarctic. And before you were allowed to go work on the ice, they required you to go through a two-day snow school, snow survival school, and also um, sea ice travel, learning how to travel safely over the sea ice. Um, cooking and scouts led directly into cooking in Antarctica, another one of the survival skills that we had to, to learn and demonstrate. So all of these skills that I needed as a scientist down there, I actually learned in scouting before I ever got started. Here's another really interesting thing. We're not, that we'll not see this on my next trip, but this is Mount Erebus here, the volcano. This is the Erebus Glacier, and this is the shoreline. So this is where the glacier leaves the land and goes out and floats on top of the ocean. This is about three miles from here to here to the tip. This little white cliff face is about 25 feet high. This is the side of that cliff face. And glaciers go up and down over cracks and uneven areas on the ground, and they form crevasses or giant cracks. Some of these are cracks big enough you could drop a house into. But they're really dangerous places to be if you're trying to walk through. And in fact, in 2016, when I was there, one of the glaciologists whose specialty was studying crevasses fell into a crevasse and died while we were there. But once they're out on the ocean, they're really stable and they form these ice caves and you can crawl into them because they're not um, unsupported. And some of the some of the scenery and some of the blues in some of these places and some of the crystals were absolutely amazingly fabulous. And in fact, the ceiling were covered with ice crystals. That ice crystal is the size of a dinner plate. And yet it's only about a 16th of an inch thick. And when you, when you broke one off, it sounded like fine crystal, like a crystal goblet as it shattered. I mean, it was just, the whole ceiling was covered with these crystals. Now I mentioned some of the older um, scientific outposts that can still be seen. This one's from 1902, 1903. This was a Swedish expedition on Brown Island up near the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, I got to see this on my last trip in December of 2019. But the ones that everybody knows about are Shackleton's trip. So Ernest Shackleton, um, Tried to be the first person to the pole, but lost out. He didn't make it when he was there in his 1904 expedition. Um, so he, and then of course, Robert Falcon Scott and Raul Dominson both made it after that. So he decided on his 1914 that he'd be the first person to cross Antarctica. So he was gonna start at the Weddell Sea and then cross to, and, um, to the South Pole and then exit Ross Island where all the other expeditions um, started. But his ship, got crushed in the ice. Um, he kind of foretold this as he was looking for people. He advertised it, supposedly. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. You know, it makes it sound really good, doesn't it? He's not sweet-talking it. Yes, yeah, sweet-talking. Honor and recognition in case of success. And he got a crew of people to go. They left from South Georgia. Um, they actually left from England, but they went to South Georgia. That was their jumping off spot. The South Sandwich Islands, they went down to the continent. They got caught in the ice, um, carried along in the ice until the boat was crushed. Then the um, 
they drifted across the ice until the ice they were on melted and disappeared. They launched their whaling boats and went to Elephant Island, sailed to Elephant Island, at which point they were on land, but still not in a very good position because nobody ever went to Elephant Island. The nearest people were back on South Georgia. Um, where's my button here? Whoops. Back on South Georgia. So they sailed 700 miles in an open whale, um, whaling boat that was only about 20 feet long and landed on South Georgia, which is an incredible feat of seamanship. Only they landed on the wrong side of South Georgia and then had to climb an unexplored 10,000 foot high mountain range and go over the top to get back to the whaling station where they'd started three years before. Now, what most people don't recognize is that Shackleton had men that had left and were waiting for him on Ross Island. Unbeknownst to him, he asked about them when he got back here three years later. Nobody had ever heard of what happened to those guys. Turns out those guys had gotten stranded also. And so he borrowed a ship, sailed to New Zealand, sailed back down and rescued all those guys as well, and then sailed out. So here's a picture of his ship captured by a photo photographer crushed in the ice. This is a, a painting of their whaling ship as they were leaving Elephant Island. Um, this is Robert Falcon Scott's hut from 1905. This is on hut um, point, and this is McMurdo Station in the background. So this is the current largest base in the United States um, on the edge of Ross Island, holds upwards of about 1,300 people in the summer. And this is where Scott was in 1905 with his more modest abode. These are dogs that were left in their dog huts from the Shackleton expedition. There's one of the dogs that's still there. Hmm. Doggy wants a bone, I think. This is Shackleton's hut. This is at Cape Evans. Um, this is John Heine coming out. But you go inside this hut and you see all the supplies. They went and raided Scott's leftover supplies from when he died on the way back from the pole. So they had more food. These are all the supplies that are left inside the hut, still on shelves. This is the slowest catch-up in the South, Heinz 57. They, they had to get out in a hurry because when he went to get his men, there was another storm coming up. They literally had about four hours to load everything up and get out of there. And so they abandoned a lot of stuff, a lot of their research notes, a lot of their personal items. So you go down there and there were novels that they were reading, research notes they left behind, research specimens, clothing on the walls, sleeping bags in the bunks, everything that they didn't need on the vessel they grabbed what was most important and they walked away. I mean, if you think about it, if you had four hours to empty out your house that you've been living in for the last three years, what would you bring with you? What can you carry in your arms a mile away before you load the boat to be able to get out of there? Not an awful lot. Um, Shackleton is actually buried on South Georgia. He died on his 1922 expedition. Uh, his 50 year anniversary is going to be next January. Died on my daughter's birthday, January 6th. So these are all things that you can see down there. And if you've got it, if you're at all interested, I'm bringing another group down there. I've got spots for two more divers left um, this coming December, December 12th to 22. You've got to spend a couple days transiting in each direction. You can't go on the 2012. The boat leaves on the 12th from South America. It takes at least two days to get there. But if you have any interest, um, drop me a note or drop Ken a note. Ken will put you in contact with me and we'll see if we can make it happen. Um, we're going to have a fun time. This is our crew from last year. Everybody, you know, about half of them were divers. Half were not. You don't have to be a diver to go. But I have two diving spots. Another nap. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And this is a good time for questions if we have any questions, Ken. You may feel free to unmute and do that, or not, or just or hold not. your hands up and do that. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> and uh, let's see here. I'm go Jeff, uh, do the uh, lose the share screen, if you would. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. All there right. So Carl tells me on his thing, raise hand is in um, participants. In mine, it's in reactions, or you can use one of your own hands, if, if you like. 
Sophie, am I remembering right? Didn't weren't you going to do this with Jeff a number of years ago? This I did no? it with I, I don't remember the name of the outfit. Uh, we were on a Russian research vessel, and I re, I remember that we were we were the second um, uh, dive group that went. The first one got canceled because somebody got hurt on the boat. Anyway, on the ship, and yeah, so I did I did the trip. I did dive. Uh, yeah, they had they. It was amazing. We lost one of our passengers on the way way back. And yeah, I oh, was that the that. That was, was that the burger experience. that got lost? I yes, yes, it was. Yep, you, I remember he that. He had too. written. Yeah, Jeff, did you I, say burger or murder? I was on the bridge yeah. with the captain. Burger, burger with a B. Yeah, we he, don't want you guys to think this yes. is an episode of Law and Order, not murder, <laughs> but burger. I was on the bridge, and uh, the captain killed the engine and he thought he saw something fly by and sure enough they did roll call three times and he was missing but they uh in his log in his in his bunk his roommate brought that up and he said um once he saw the giant petrol that all his dreams had come true so he offed himself everybody pretty much he committed suicide for sure but it was rough out there, man. Alive. <laughs> it can definitely get pretty bumpy. I was going to ask you, Jeff, Jeff. How much weight did it do you use when you when I you dive? I typically dive with about forty pounds down there. And the reason it took that me is, 60. Just, yeah, you want a lot of gas in your dry suit because it's the air that keeps the air insulation that keeps you warm. <laughs> Jeff, we got a we got a chat oh, question geez, from. <laughs> We got a chat question from Alan Blaustein. It says one of the photos showed colorful corals. Are they like tropical corals? Do they live symbiotically with zooxanthellae that are responsible for the color? I'm going to have to confess I don't know the answer to that. I'm just impressed he, he knew the word zooxanthellae. <laughs> Wait a minute, Glenn. He gets, he, two, might, he gets bonus points for that. Glenn, Glenn might know. Glenn is one of our education volunteers at the aquarium. Glenn, what do you think? Um, I imagine not although uh because soft coral in general um don't have the sim symbiotic relationship uh however and the hard coral actually do they're the uh they're they're the calcium carbonate and they're the the reef building coral all righty thank you very much glenn uh any other questions for jeff either by Signaling your hand or just raising your hand. Oh, Sam. Of course, now we have to see if Sam's going to find the unmute button or not. <laughs> nope, Sam, you're mute. Sam, you're still muted. Uh, wait a minute. I might be able oh, to. Fine. Sam, you're still muted. Hang on. Let me see if I can send you a. Uh... Sam, we can't hear you. Is there a thing to unmute on your screen now? Okay, can you hear there me? You go. Yes, sir. Okay, Jeff. Uh, Tommy Thompson made the first lockout dive underneath the Arctic uh, uh, ice cap in 1947. That was about uh, 70 years ago. What do you expect to happen in the next 40, 50, 70 years from now uh, regarding to the Arctic uh, continent as far as diving and, and exploration well first of all i think that equipment is going to improve to the point where it's going to be much more comfortable to be able to do that kind of diving um they're already making forays into actively heated suits so like on this last trip i had a, a, a heated vest that runs off a battery pack and originally those battery mm -hmm. packs were external that you had to plumb through your dry suit they now have suits that you wear the batteries on the inside with an RF signal that goes between the two to be able to control the temperature in it. So you don't have to have the through hole fitting, which typically leaked. And right now they're just vests, but there are several companies that have since come out, including DUI, 
with a suit that covers both your hands and arms and legs. So you'll be able to get by with less insulation and to Sophie's point, much less lead, which will make it a lot more convenient. Um, they don't have them yet, but I would, I would be very surprised if 50 years from now, we don't have gloves that are electrically heated. That would allow us to be able to work for a much longer period of time as well. And with more dexterity at the same time. Um, Rebreathers are just now in their infancy um, in polar diving conditions. I would expect to see more work with rebreathers being done down there, um, both as the technology advances and as we get more used to diving in real cold water environments with them in those kinds of areas. And quite frankly, I think it'd be really cool and it wouldn't surprise me if we saw a habitat going in underneath the ice in one of these places where people could live in it for an entire year doing research underneath the ice. I tried what? promoting that back in the early 90s and we just couldn't afford it. But it's only money and somebody at some point is going to come up with the money to make that happen. Well, you know, Sub Imlu was the uh, McGinnis uh, under, underneath the ice cap in Canada in the 1960s. He had the Sub Igloo. Right, yep. And, uh, he was the first to explore under underneath uh, the ice, I think, uh, at an extended time. Is that correct? I don't know. I... He's the only habitat that I know of that's gone underneath the ice, although the Russians exactly. may have done something that I'm unaware of. And you know that is rotting out in a field in Canada? It's what? It's, uh, it's, it's laying in a field in Canada, rotting away. I did not know that. Yes. If for any reason it's in Ontario, we do have someone on, on tonight who's in Ontario who can go grab it if you know where it is, Sam. <laughs> I don't. Well, uh, McGinnis lives in Ontario. I've been to his house several ah. times. And um, he is no longer interested in diving. He is it's in something security or some darn thing. But he's a P, he's a MD. You know, so, Sam, there was a Navy diver that also did a dive in the Antarctic in 1947 during high jump. Well, that was Tommy Thompson, wasn't it? No, uh, Jensen. Um, oh, I didn't know his, that. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what his first name was. Um, I'd have to look it up, but if you drop me an email, I'll look it up for you because I've got it in my notes. Um, but yeah, he was he was he's the first recorded person I know of in the in the military that did a dive down there, and I'm not sure when his dive was compared to when Tommy's was. Well, I don't know which one of them was actually first. Uh, Tommy is credited as being number one, but I, uh, who knows? Uh, Seventy years ago, you know. Exactly. Long, long time ago. Yeah, long time ago. It's good to see you, by the way. Same here. It's been a few years, and my friend. It has indeed. <laughs> I noticed you have a little snow in your on your chin there. Well, well, that's artificial frosting for Christmas. Yeah, I do that with my Christmas tree. I was going to say, Sam, you're calling the snow white there. You got a little, <laughs> little snow there under your nose as well. And in case you guys, I have a little know, bit. <laughs> in case you guys don't know, Dr. Sam Miller, Sam's been around for a little while and is sort of a walking encyclopedia. Yeah, I guess, I guess Sam, you're the diving equivalent of Wikipedia. Uh, he knows everything about everything and uh, and has written voluminously about it. So that's terrific. Uh, we got two questions uh, from the chat uh, from Kaz Azawa. He says, I noticed most of the interior of the camps look like there's no dust. Is that a condition of the cold weather? Well, you've got to remember that the soil for most of the year down there is frozen. Um, there's ice over a lot of it and the permafrost starts very shallow. Um, that said, in the summertime in McMurdo and Ross Island, summertime being relative. Um, it's not uncommon for the temperatures to warm up to 35, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, the dust or the rock surface unfreezes. And during the windstorm, that was one of the things that I had a difficult time dealing with sometimes were the, was the dust that was being blown around in the wind with my contacts. And so it got to be pretty uncomfortable later in the season. It was actually much easier when it was minus 20 degrees then it was just cold, but at least I didn't have to put up with stuff getting in my eyes. Did you have a problem with your contacts freezing to your eye when you're outside? No, you're, I never did. I, for whatever reason, you know, you're, you, we're warm-blooded. So I never had that issue. 
you know, and um, ice in my beard, ice in my mustache, ice dripping out my nose, but never with my but, eyes. Um, well, and speaking of freezing, do you have any issues with uh, rebreathers icing over while you're diving? Um, once we were in the water, we were typically fine. We had one instance where one of the automatic addition valves that adds diluent, adds air to the system, froze open. And it sent me like a Polaris missile from 70 feet all the way up to the surface at about 15 feet on the underside of the ice at what we later estimated was an ascent rate of about 300 feet per minute. So just a typical recreational diver ascent rate. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, Andrea Horwat would like to know, were you always diving with dry hoods? I never dove with a dry hood down there. I, well, that's not true. I dove with a dry hood twice and I disliked it so much because of the bubble in my head that I switched to wetsuit hoods. And now my preferred head protection is a double layer hood, a two or a two millimeter hood underneath a seven millimeter hood. Cause once your head goes numb, it, it then- You know, then, the initial feeling is kind of like a dull ice pick being punched through your forehead. Yeah. But once that goes away, it's <laughs> no not problem. bad. No problem. Glenn, you've got your hand up and everything. Um, yeah, I just wondered, uh, you're going through a hole in the ice. Uh, how do you get, how do you get up and down? We actually have ladders that go through the holes. The ladders, um, are made out of plywood two by fours and we just climb up and down and they lower them into the water with weights down on the end of them to be able to hold them down. Uh, for what it's worth, Ashley Kidd is my friend in Ontario and that's Ontario, Canada, not Ontario out in Riverside County. She says, my eyeballs definitely freeze in minus 30 degrees C, Canadian winters, yikes. Salt water will freeze them. So <laughs> you may have dodged a bullet there, Jeff. Excellent. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, uh, by the way. <laughs> any other questions that we got? May I uh, have one more? Sure, Sam. Or uh, should I say, sure, Elizabeth. Uh, Sam, there sure, you go. Sure, Elizabeth. Jeff, uh, very interesting. You you say John was your uh, mentor, uh, John Resick. Uh, I didn't realize that. And I have John's old spear gun. Oh. Uh, I, I don't remember how he gave it to me. He didn't want it. And he said, here, take it. So I took it. And I still have it. Yeah, they John Resick and uh, John Wozni were probably my two early diving mentors that I spent a lot of time. Well, uh, good for you. I, I know I met you through John Wozni when you were about 16, I think. 15, 16? Somewhere in that neighborhood. You, you've got a B in physics. I remember that. And <laughs> oh, my God, that was the end of the world. A B. <laughs> sure. Now you're going to wrap me out to all of these people here. Thanks a lot, Sam. <laughs> there go the book sales on the rebreather, and man exactly. doesn't even know his physics enough to get an A. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, no, John had to change it to an A. Uh, I'm sure, uh, Jeff, that's a long I'm story. Sure Jeff earned the A the old-fashioned way. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Any other any other final questions? Well, then we thank you all for your rapt attention. And once again, you can do that muted or otherwise. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, remind you, we're doing these Zoom Seeker meetings every month. Next month, uh, going to be March 9th. It's always the second Tuesday of the month at 730. If you forget what we're doing, they're all listed on the Reef Seekers website, uh, cleverly under Zoom Seeker Speakers and Schedule. Uh, and if you want to listen to this again, it'll be up on Facebook as well as on uh, the Zoom Seekers page. But March 9th, um, we will be having Mike Emmerman, who uh, speaking, who is a, a disaster expert. And uh, the title of his talk is Life in the Fast Lane. And I'll be talking about uh, various things that can go wrong and how our, our mindset can sort of uh, help us avoid those various things. So uh, again, I've got, I've got to drop in one more quick thing, Ken. Sure, 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 sure. My sister just chastised me on chat for not giving a shout out to her. 
for sewing on that really nice pink heart on the shorts of my Boy Scout picture. I was going to let that one go, actually. I, was, I wasn't going to ask why there's a heart on it. I was going to comment about that. Yeah, I was like, nice shorts. Yeah. That was, that was me asking my fixed sister to fix the hole in my shorts, and that's what she came up with. And that's probably the last time you ever asked her to do that, I'm guessing. No, nope, probably not. I All right. no shame. What can I say? Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, actually, a program note, Jeff, for you. Carl wanted to talk to you and I when we're done, so I'll... Uh, I'll probably just send us a separate invite. So we'll just take it off to another, another room, but thank you all very much uh, for joining us and uh, come back next month uh, if you can. And uh, well, hell come back next month, even if you can't. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, wave goodbye. Thanks, hey, everybody. thanks for having me. I'm going to hit end meeting for all and Jeff, check your email, Carl, check your email. I'll send out a separate invite.